Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Julie Samuel Wisman. It's my pleasure to welcome those of you that have joined us here on the Zoom call today, as well as those on with us on Facebook Live. This is Kansas City Oasis. We're a secular humanist community uh, based here in the Midwest. We feel that the human experience, experience is better when it's shared, and we're so pleased that you have chosen to share it with us today. Um, we really want to do what we can to build a community that is not based on dogma, but based on coming together around our five core values, which are people are more important than beliefs, meaning comes from making a difference, reality is known through reason, human hands solve human problems, and be accepting and be accepted. We have a great lineup this morning. Our musical guest is Dan York. Our community moment will be our very own JJ Cantrell. And our featured speaker is Jessica Pazinski. I hope I got that close. Sorry, she's nodding. Yes, close anyway. Um, and so without any further ado, I'm going to welcome Dan to the stage. And we will get to, to hear his musical stylings first thing this morning. Thank you. Starting this from scratch. Neither one knew that the other had a past. What do you do with a broken heart? What do you do when it's all your fault? What do you do when you know that you're the only one to blame? Chasing monsters in the dark. I'm rewriting every story from the start. Curtain falls after I take my final bow. Baby, I'm the monster now. We were hurting and in pain. And I thought she only had herself to blame. What do you do with a broken heart? What do you do when it's all your fault? What do you do when you find that you're the only one to blame? Chasing monsters in the dark. I'm rewriting every story from the start. Curtain falls after I take my final bow. Baby, I'm the monster now. Something's underneath your bed. Tears are running in your sweat. Yes. I used to think it, it was only in your head. But it's me instead. Yeah. What do you do with a broken heart? What do you do when it's all your fault? What do you do when you find that you're the only one to blame? Chasing monsters in the dark. I'm rewriting every story from the start. Curtain falls after I take my final bow. Baby, I'm the monster now. Right on, that was fantastic. Yeah, you'll get you'll we get some virtual applause here because we all clap, it all all the sound goes to pot. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. And this song is called High Roller. <laughs> She's got an international appeal She's got me itching to make a deal Flaws in my face Keeps me in my place She's got me wondering what is real 
It's got a concept of loyalty That's a little too much for me But I just get by By closing an eye Not asking what I can't see Oh She's a high roller A roller coaster She make the most of me She's a high roller, a roller coaster. She'll make you think you're free. She'll make you think you're free. She's got pockets full of gold. That's as black as her soul. Beautiful people fall down a meter, they get out of control. She's got a powerful mountain landscape, she's got it all caught on tape. If you blink your eyes at the wrong time, you might forget to call it safe. much <clears throat> oh gosh sorry so after the break uh yeah you and i'll dig in a little bit to your uh what inspires you musically how you got into music uh, so we'll be looking forward to that after our, after our break here in a bit thank you so much dan if you'd also type in either your venmo or paypal link in the chat some people want to tip you absolutely thank you all right thank you okay so i have a there are a few um let me Connect me. We have a few uh, celebrations to announce. We have birthdays today, or kind of a, a slew of birthdays. Um, those include uh, Van Gabriel on the 14th, Tara McNaughton on the 17th, Doug uh, Hotchkinson on the 18th, and Scott Gabriel and Carolyn Martin on the 19th. So a lot of people out there in Facebook land or maybe, maybe in person, even if you're fully vaccinated, to wish some happy birthdays to you. As always, if you have a celebration that you'd like to share, please reach out to one of the MCs, uh, one of our um, board members, and they will, will be more than happy to celebrate it with you. Uh, any, any positive life event, you got a new house, you got a new job, uh, something exciting is happening. It looks like there's been some exciting happenings on Facebook uh, as far as people relocating and looking for houses. And so once that all comes to fruition, Please share that with us and we will celebrate it with you. And with that, we will move into our community moment. Again, it's our very own JJ Cantrell. They gave us three words to describe themselves, complicated, compulsive, and well-intentioned. And if they had a warning label, it would be the bifurcated mind is a terrible thing to juggle, which I think they're going to explain to us a little more fully this morning. So with that, let's please welcome JJ. Hey, everybody. Um, 
as usual, my bent is to talk about some philosophical relationship, because that's the cool thing. That's what all the cool kids are doing now. Um, today, I wanted to talk about some of the consequences and things that fall out of a surgery. It's a very rare surgery that's designed to deal with people who have extreme seizures that are broad seizures, where it is the entire brain activity that goes off and begins firing during the seizure, the ep uh, epileptic episode. This surgery is called a corpus callosotomy. And that is named after the part of the brain, because everybody, uh, raise your hand if you have not seen a picture of a brain. All right. You'll notice how the brain has a right side. I'm not sure how the camera is doing, so I'm going to hold up my left hand. Right side and a left side. And then you'll notice there's that thin beam of material that separates the two hemispheres of the brain. That space, almost all of it, is a part of the brain called the corpus callosum. And a corpus callosotomy is when surgeons who have tried everything else, they've tried medical interventions, they've tried other stimulus interventions, and they've run out of options. So now they're going to do a very invasive surgery and they cut your head open and they slice your brain in half. And what they found is in like 75% of patients that go through the surgery, seizures go away. There's a great success rate for this procedure to treat a certain family of epilepsy, for this procedure, procedure and seizure sound a lot alike, for this procedure to treat a family of epileptic, epileptic conditions. But what they found after they started doing this was that there are certain consequences. In one patient who experienced this, the researchers studying this patient set up a screen and they had a divider so that this side of the brain could only see this side and this side of the brain could only see this side. And they would shine light on one side or the other, or both. And what they found was that in situations where I believe it was the right set of lights was flashed on, researchers would ask the patient, What's, did you see any lights? And the patient would be like, no, I didn't see any lights. But the very same patient, researchers would flash both sides of lights. And I think sometimes one side, but the article I'm looking at says both sides of lights. And then the researchers wouldn't ask the patient to say if there were any lights or what side the lights were on. The researchers would say, point to which side had lights. And the patient wouldn't point to both sides. There's a history of patients for either this surgery or instances where a naturally occurring event causes something called split brain syndrome. One patient that had split brain syndrome, a very extreme case where this patient had divided behaviors between the two sides. This patient would try to get dressed in the morning and with one hand, they would pull their pants up. And then the other hand didn't want to get dressed. That side of the brain did not want to get dressed and it would pull the pants down. The other side would pull the pants up. The other side would pull the pants down. This is documented. This patient is the most extreme example because almost never in these situations do these behaviors concur. It is almost exclusively when patients are dealing with split brain syndrome, we'll get to that, David. When patients are dealing with split brain syndrome, like the patient I was talking about, they do one thing on one side of their body and then they do something else on the other side. But this patient actually had one instance 
where the patient attempted to choke his wife with his left hand and the right hand reached up and grabbed it. It's almost, it's so rare that it might be anecdotal because as I said, typically it's one thing or the other. In the same way, you can think of it as kind of like objects of consciousness. I was describing this to Dan before the, uh, before the, the program had started and was talking about this idea, which is one of many hypo hypothesized explanations for this set of split brain behaviors. And it's the idea that there's kind of an estuary of conscious. And typically you have different parts of your brain that are just objects that do things like they handle speech and they handle tactile sensation, which is another thing that shows up in split brain tests as being a deviation like the ability to tell what something is by feel and describe it by sight. Split brain patients have a very difficult time and usually are unsuccessful. Like they will feel like sandpaper or like a child's binky and they'll hold it around in their hand. And if it's in the side that deals with speech, the right side, they won't be able to tell you what they're holding. But if they hold something similar in the left side so that they can feel both sides, they could then tell. There are a lot of, there have been a lot of studies. There's a lot of nuance. But this idea is that there are different parts of your brain and they all are their own kind of aware object. And they flow together into this estuary that we then present as a single object of consciousness. Like there is one person experiencing one thing. But split the idea of split brain, although it does not and should never be interpreted as this idea that there are multiple types of consciousness for sure. Like it doesn't answer the question of consciousness. It creates a lot of difficult and subtle nuance in the idea that there is just one self experiencing one thing, processing data together. It's more to use a very bad, but barely serviceable analogy. Most people think of it as like, if you were a computer, a computer has a processor, but really computers oftentimes have multiple processors and each processor runs multiple threads. And each one of these threads is its own experiential calculation that presents a result in the union at the end of the processing process. And the split brain problem creates this idea. Um, so that's what I wanted to talk about today. Quickly, I'll address the item that David Ricks brought up is there is a anecdotal story about a person who underwent a split brain surgery and then one side of this person was Christian, one side of this person was atheist. I want to stress that although this is oft repeated by people that I generally appreciate, like Sam Harris, this story, the only source of it in the literature is from a YouTube video by an Indian neurosurgeon who gets some of the details wrong about the process of split brain surgery, but he might have just been misspeaking because the article I read about this topic was happy to paint a picture that there is one consciousness, it exists outside of the brain. Like definitely the, the article had an agenda, but I've looked on my own and I have never found an actual like peer reviewed or a paper just without review, even submitted to a medical journal that describes the patient in question. So I'm of the opinion that the Christian atheist split brain patient should be taken with a very tiny grain of salt. There is no treatment that I have come across for the idea of split brain. Um, and I think that we, it, there, like I was talking with Dan again yesterday, the ideas that we are developing in real neuropsychology, like this is a science that is one, Oh, let's see. 50, okay. uh, I would say it's about one fifteenth as old as chemistry, like real, like post enlightenment scientific method chemistry. Um, and as far as just 
you know, dealing with things like this, it's one of the newest sciences that we are trying to address. So the split brain issues are very, very crucial to the big picture of how brains work and what makes people people. But I, I found that super interesting and I just wanted to talk about that today. Mo oh, lastly, Jocelyn, most people that undergo this surgery for like the corpus colostomy, like they're way better off, but they are much happier because they're not having grand mal seizures all the time. And with these weird, like, because the experiments I was talking about, like they involve like actually putting yourself in a situation where you can, you have to not, like it forces the brain to not be able to compensate. But in day-to-day -day life, People who have undergone corpus colostomies are practically indistinguishable from other people because brains compensate. Okay, just wanted to touch on that too. Okay, Whew. that was that was fascinating. I had never never heard of that before. Um, so let's talk about you a little bit. All right, everybody that's here, I've uh, I have tendered my resignation as music coordinator for Oasis. Um, I put kind of a, uh, a, a target end date for the first Sunday in September. And my goal is to support the board as they look for a, either just someone that's just gonna do a straight replacement of what I already do, or come up with an alternative approach to booking the music at Oasis moving forward, but for whatever they do, this will be a couple month process of me supporting the board to make sure that whatever transition the board wants to conduct, excuse me, it goes as smoothly as possible. I've done this for a long time, but for a long time I've had some things that, like some personal behavior issues that I haven't taken the time to deal with that need, you know, proper therapy. And I'm just, I want to make sure that I'm setting aside time to do that. And I've got that, those processes scheduled, but I think I need to step away from some of my responsibilities so that I can more directly address some of the things that I'm concerned with in my own self. So I'm going to take this time to do that. That was my impetus for making this decision. Okay. Well, we, you know, we, we all know and value um, the importance of self-care and I'm, I'm glad to hear that that you're taking that time for yourself. Also, we are so indebted to you. This this community is so indebted to you. Um, when you announce this to our committee members that you know work on Sunday production, um, there was such an outpouring of love and just appreciation for all the great music that you have generated yourself and shared with us, but also the introductions to all the great Kansas City artists that we've gotten to meet through you and. You are irreplaceable, my friend, but we appreciate well, you'll that, everything, you've, everything you've done. I mean, a lot of the, my, like, I was able to do a lot of this because I've had incredible support from the board, the committee members, the community itself, and, like, the people that worked on the sound team with me, like Terry and Marge are here. Like, there are a lot of really wonderful people that I am indebted to for being able to be as successful as I was at helping kind of steer like develop and steer the music program for as long as I have. And uh, you all are going to be fine because that help I'm sure is that those people are going to be there too. And people continually come in from our community that are extremely talented and eager to make our community the best it can be. So I'm not worried. And I'm you're not, we're going to still see your face, right? You're going to give a whole Julie, bunch. Mother Even Julie. though I apologize in advance. Yeah. No, I know. I know. But <laughs> Yeah, a classic David line there. Um, thank you so much. And and again, through this transition will take place through the remainder of summer, um, and then you know in September we'll we'll see what we'll see what happens. But we sure. are, are so grateful to know you, to know you as our friend, and to be able to support this effort of self care without without any additional pressure on you. Um, you know, we're a community that that really believes that. Um, we use our hands and sometimes we have to use our hands to take care of ourselves. So well, thank you, you all very much. I love you all very much. Okay. 
So with that, maybe you will win breakout room roulette this morning and get Jay in and <laughs> get Jay in your breakout room and you can chat a little bit more. With that, I'm going to go ahead and start our breakout rooms. Um, we'll we'll um, stay out for about 10 minutes this morning and then we'll come back for the uh, second half of our program. We'll see y'all in about 10 minutes. Okay. Hello? Hello? How's the time? This is Fred. Hello? Hello? Hello?
Hi, Fred. How are you? Well, I'm fine, thank you. Who am I talking to? This is Jocelyn. Sorry, I don't have a video going this morning. Yes, I'm. All I'm getting is the coffee break uh, 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 scene on on my video. I I see your picture, but I don't see your video. Uh -huh. Yeah, I'm. I uh, oh, slow slow morning getting started here, so it's better that I just leave the <laughs> leave the picture up. But it's good to see everybody this morning. Yes, it was very interesting uh, community moment. Oh, I loved that. That was awesome. I, I loved learning about the brain, and JJ is so so smart. He is. So J, that was JJ. Yeah. Wow, he would cut his hair and everything. Yeah, yeah. I didn't recognize JJ at first. That was pretty cool. My wife recognized him, but I didn't. Ah, uh, yeah. Uh, looks different without his long or their their long locks. But what does he do for a living? I don't know, actually. Um, he was a. I thought he was. He was really into music, and it sounds like he's has a real scientific interest. Oh, I I don't know much about what JJ does for a living, but they are one of the smartest people I've ever. And actually, I've never met him in, or met them in person um, because I well, I joined Oasis like one week before everything went into lockdown, so I never got to see anyone in person. And then, um, you know. I've been here through the year of COVID. Uh, so maybe now I'll get to start meeting people. Yeah. I've met more people on the uh, breakout room than I did in person. Oh, did you? Yeah. I suppose it gives more chance to talk to people that maybe you wouldn't normally as well. Um, yeah. Because I assume that we all just sort of navigate or, or are drawn to the people that we talk to every week, the same people. I've enjoyed the breakout rooms as well. I kind of, it'd be so cool if we could find a way to incorporate that into um, whatever we do when we meet in person. I think so too. I think that's really be good. And because uh, we live way out in Lee Summit and, and so where oh. most of the meeting places have been in town. So in inclement weather, especially, it would be good. Oh, right. Yeah. I'm out in Lawrence. Um, May I ask how you uh, uh, access uh, Oasis Sunday morning? Do you, do you use your phone or do you use your... Oh, yeah, I use my phone. Sometimes I use my laptop, but um, my laptop is fairly new to me anyway the computer itself is several several years old um but a friend gifted it to me very recently and so sometimes I forget that I have it um because <laughs> uh, I'm I'm just not used to having a a laptop that has capabilities to to do zoom and things like that so today it's the phone because again I forgot forgot to have the laptop until this moment I uh Hi guys. Hi, Andy. I'm off the phone. <laughs> yeah, I yeah. love your background. My name. Oh, thank you. <laughs> the psychotic hot dog family. <laughs> Is that just on your wall? No, it's it's there. I have a green screen. Oh, see, I kept thinking you were in like your kitchen, and somehow that's how you decorated and I was like oh my gosh that's amazing <laughs> that would be a very different <laughs> kitchen and much larger than the kitchen I have in this house oh well, yeah I am um, the way that I'm I'm seeing it on my side it just looks like a little corner in the mm -hmm. kitchen but that's that's awesome yeah that that's um the little blonde child looks I don't know like she could either be about to attack you 
where she's really excited about eating her hot dog. Oh, I just all, can't all, help. All three of them are, oh, I can point. All yeah. three of them are, are rather <laughs> excited by the prospect of eating these hot dogs. Mm. <laughs> Before I became vegetarian, that's how I felt about getting to have a hot dog. And um, where's, where's that place? It's like a huge warehouse with a bunch of food. And then they, Sam's Club and the other uh, one. Costco. Costco. Costco's the bomb. <laughs> Yeah, they used to have a Polish, although it wasn't a great, it wasn't a great Polish dog. Somehow when you say it like that, it makes me, <laughs> it makes me think of a little dog that speaks Polish <laughs> and is somehow like a rebel dog. Right. Of course, dogs in different countries bark in different ways. Wait, do they? Julie, well, is that thing? You, it's written down in different ways. It's and even the way it's said. Oh. Um, Garrison Keeler used to have a big bit on that. Okay, so I think we are back in the room. If everybody could, and we're back in the main room now. So if we could. Yeah, dogs in Poland say bow bow. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Woo! That's something we learned during uh, the coffee break. Dogs say different things in different languages. <laughs> uh, hi, um, everybody, we're back. Um, we are going to switch over to Dan once I find him here. There he is. Here I am. There you go. All right. So before you before you play for us this next time, I will ask you a couple questions because inquiring minds want to know. We love our um, musicians here at Kansas City Oasis. So um, here are the questions that I sort of like to ask people. What are some of your earliest musical influences? Um, I would say I, I kind of uh, started playing and singing at, you know, as young of age as I could. And uh, mm -hmm. um, really uh, started from a classical perspective, but um, I was lucky enough to have teachers who really encouraged me to to compose and and to be creative, um, and so those were great influences in my life. And then um, I got into college and and studied music there. Uh, and actually, uh, can can I say JJ Cantrell is one of my influences? Is yeah. Allow? <laughs> I was about to talk about our past. Oh, I, like it. I love it. Let's hear that. Um, so we went to college together at Mid American Nazarene University. And Dan was the best keyboard player that I could get my hands on. And I wanted to do really, really difficult, like Frank Zappa kind of stuff. At the time I was Christian um, and I wanted to do a Christian Frank Zappa kind of thing. And I, you know, reached out to Dan and asked if he wanted to uh, do a, be in a band with me. And I cannot describe, like we played together for, what was it, about four years? Three, probably about three. three There's at least at three least. into four. And for a little bit, I have no fear in saying that we were the most complicated jam band in Kansas City. <laughs> like complicated Dan and life. I both wrote lots of music, and both of us, like you know, in the first song that Dan played, there were several occasions of 11 4. Um, and uh, that was like he and no you were doing that too like we <laughs> went back and forth really making some strange music like i had written this piece that we never got to that ultimately had 137 beats in the cadence and everybody in the band was doing a different interpolation of a relationship of mathematical notes that always landed at that same point it was weird stuff like and after uh, at some point i had there is one song on YouTube of Dobson Hall with both Dan and me in the band. And it is uh, called Everything We Want. It was written by Dan. And uh, I'll put it in the chat, but don't say, listen I to it. I don't it. think I have that video. 
it is it's it from the bass player at the time john rinky it was oh. he put it up it was the one remember that studio we went to that with that friend of chad's yeah <laughs> um john actually got a roughly polished copy of that song and that might be the best single recording of any of our music but i'll put it in the chat uh, don't listen to it until like after the program or whatever, yeah. so that you know. And then may I'll put it on the private page, but yeah, so we go back a long way. That's awesome. That's awesome. Um, so, so currently, tell me maybe a little bit. We talked a little bit before the program started about um, what you're up to musically. You said social media, not not so much your thing. So uh, maybe yeah, we can't hear you play some places, but, but what are you up to? Sure. Yeah. No, I don't have too much of a web presence, um, but uh, what what the balance I have found in my life that works is kind of working the the corporate gig during the week that uh, provides you know the benefits and the income that I need, which allows me to um, kind of take the the music gigs that uh, I find fulfilling and and fun and and. Uh, 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 things like playing uh, at Oasis and and having the ability to to do the uh, compositions that I've um, put together instead of trying to necessarily fit uh, any kind of gig I can get into my schedule. And so, right. um, not that there is a, a wrong way to approach uh, a musical career, but uh, that has what I've what I've found has worked for me and, and given me life. Okay. Um, and so with that, uh, you know, I'm able to do gigs like this or um, play around Kansas City. I'll, I'll play at some weddings. Those those can be fun or, mm -hmm. or some corporate um, situations, uh, corporate events. Um, I, I've got a, a, a standing gig in an office building over at my lunch hour, which is oh, wow. uh, kind of a fun, fun one. And they give me a lot of leeway to play whatever kind of music I want to. So maybe someday we will wander through a corporate office building <laughs> and you play piano i'm assuming that's a yes. piano yes you you can't see it here but there's a, a keyboard underneath the camera yeah. that's great that's great what a, what a great outlet okay so with that please if you could please share us uh, share with us your next uh, performance piece Absolutely. Oh, wait, check and see if your original sound turned off. You may need to turn it back on. Yep, I think when I yeah. switched rooms, were you not getting my keyboard there? Yep, It uh, that happens when the, the uh, we go to breakout rooms for whatever reason. Fair enough, how about now, you hearing it? She never 
never kept 15 years ago written on her sleeve but he can't see it anymore and Anthony begs make her go away oh please don't let her stay I've been so afraid of it all Anthony knows what everybody knows people come and go but he can't come or go so Anthony stays in a world only meant for him don't let anybody in don't let anybody in they're all out for themselves but hey So we have people asking about stuff in your background now. We're so we're so nosy. We're a nosy bunch. Uh, I have my my first is your uh, looks to me to be running uh, medals over here over your <laughs> yeah, right. So, uh, most of those actually belong to my wife. She's a oh, avid, okay. avid runner. She's a runner. And does okay. uh, a lot of half marathons and five Ks and ten Ks. So oh wow, good. yeah, very very good. I see that. two I see two avid runners in our audience today too bowl of dirt, you know, I'm looking at you. Hi, sweet peas. Um, and then someone wants me to, or someone is questioning, um, is there a real guitar book compared to the jazz fake book? <laughs> guitar fake yeah. book. Sure. Yeah. yeah. There's, there's a, a <laughs> fake book and there's a real book. Oh, okay. Yeah. So problem solved, everyone that asked that question. There is a real one. Uh, great. So I will, yeah, I won't belabor, belabor that point. I think somebody else was commenting is your art puppies behind like right behind your head yeah that's uh those are our dogs and my father-in-law oh. likes to do paintings so nice yes. nice we have uh chihuahuas uh, a chihuahua oh. and a chihuahua jack russell mix oh wow they are okay. very uh hyperactive and i was gonna say <laughs> high energy that's it feels like high energy all right well thank you so much dan and we'll look forward to your final performance here at the close of our program thank you thank you I think you're muted. Also problematic. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I work at Zoom, don't tell anybody. Okay, so <laughs> uh, with that, I will introduce Jessica this morning, um, maybe, because now I can't find my introduction. I'm so sorry. Okay, this is Jessica. Jessica Pazinski is a vegan and animal rights activist in the Northwest Ohio area. She's the co-founder of the Northwest Ohio Vegans Advocates, or NOVA a group focused on grassroots vegan education. She's worked with internationally recognized animal rights organizations on multiple campaigns to end animal suffering. The Vegan Society, just briefly, their definition of veganism, a philosophy and way of living, which seeks to exclude as far as is possible and practicable all forms of exploitation of and cruelty to animals for food, clothing, or any other purpose, and by extension, promote the development and use of animal-free alternatives for the benefits of animals, humans, and the environment. So with that, we will um, let Jessica give us her presentation. And then of course, we'll have some question and answers afterwards. Well, uh, as I said, I am uh, Jessica Pasinski. 
I uh, forgive me if I stumble through this a little bit. This is my first public speaking, <laughs> as it were, um, with Nova uh, that with the grassroots um, act activism. Um, what we do is we host tables at area fairs and festivals and people can get free literature resources. Uh, we have visual guides and I am a little bit better with answering questions. So uh, bear with me, please. Um, to simplify a little bit what the, def the definition um, they read was, uh, a vegan uh, pretty much is someone who doesn't eat, wear animal or where animal derived products or use products tested on animals, a more simplified version of that. Um, and people really go vegan for three main reasons, uh, for animals, their health and for the environment. Um, animals, um, we believe exist for their own reason, not for us to eat. Uh, vegans do not see humans as superior, but as equal to all living things that um, have the right to their own lives. Animals have feelings. They wish to spend time with their families. They desire freedom and um, they can feel pain. Um, the Main animals I'll speak on, uh, chickens, cows, pigs, and fish. While uh, exploitation pretty much happens across the board to all animals, and there's very few um, federal laws. Uh, uh, f there are very few federal laws protecting animals uh, from humane, to have humane conditions, um, humane slaughter, which, that's kind of an oxymoron of humane slaughter. It's <laughs> not uh, exactly possible. Um, chickens, for example, um, they are probably the most abused animals um, on the planet. They are cramped into dark, filthy warehouses by the thousands. The, they're as chicks, their beaks and toes are cut off with hot blades, males, um, from usually the day they are born, um, there is no use for male chicks. So they are ground up alive, gassed, or crushed to death. Um, they have no use in animal agriculture. Um, cows uh, for meat spend pretty much their entire lives in grassless feedlots. Dairy cows uh, used for milk, are forcibly impregnated in what the industry calls rape racks. Their uh, cows are just like humans. They produce milk only for their children. So they are continuously impregnated and their children are ripped from them the day, usually the day they are born. So humans can have the milk. Um, pigs are incredibly uh, intelligent creatures. They are as smart as three-year-olds, smarter than some dogs. Um, but unfortunately, they spend most of their lives in factory farms on concrete floors. Females are um, in gestation crates with no ability to turn around. They don't have the ability to nuzzle their babies uh, in these uh, facilities. And babies that are uh, considered not viable or don't have value are killed, uh, usually just by throwing them on the concrete floor. Um, there's not much compassion happening in the factory farming industry. 99% of meat um, comes from these facilities. They're not in the idealistic, pastures with grass and space. Majority of the meat you see in the grocery store does not come from those places. Um, uh, fish, uh, they are the most killed animal um, every year in the trillions. Uh, they feel pain, they 
have memories. I know as a kid, I was always told fish have a three second memory and that's not true. Um, fish are very intelligent themselves. Uh, and with fishing, um, the gill nuts and things that are used for them, they gather undiscriminately. So fishing uh, also kills dolphins, turtles, pretty much all uh, sea life. Um, and moving into that, the other re another reason for being going vegan is for the environment. Um, the meat industry emits more greenhouse gases than all transportation in the world combined. Um, they have found that uh, the ice caps are melting faster and it kind of goes along with how our uh, society is treating animals in, um, sorry, <laughs> um, goes along with how we're treating animals. Um, the Amazon rainforests are burned at a rate of several football fields a day. And 91% of that destruction is due to animal agriculture for cattle farming, pig farming, things like that. Um, and in the US, animal agriculture uses 56% of water. Um, and there's already issues with access to clean water for humans. So for such a large amount to be going to animals is really unnecessary. Uh, a third reason people go vegan uh, is for their health. Um, many chronic health conditions um, uh, track back to dietary lifestyle uh, choices. And while there is some debate, uh, there are several conditions that can be reversed with a whole foods plant-based diet, uh, such as diabetes, heart disease, and even some skin conditions. Um, they connect with issues with dairy. Uh, the World Health Organization even designated processed meats like bacon and sausage uh, to the same carcinogen category as asbestos and cigarettes. So while bacon can be a favorite, it is uh, not great for your health. <laughs> um, the one question I get asked the most is what's the difference between a vegan and a vegetarian? Uh, a vegetarian um, still consumes or, or may still consume dairy or eggs, honey, animal byproducts in general. Vegans consume nothing that comes from animals or an animal that was exploited. Um, so that's the main difference. Um, and there's also a difference between vegan and a plant-based diet. Um, as read with the vegan society's definition of veganism, uh, vegan is a full lifestyle encompassing aspects of daily life. Plant-based is just removing animal products from your diet, but does not take ethics into account. Um, for example, a product that is well known, Impossible. Um, Impossible is considered plant-based because they chose to test the um, original meat products uh, on rats. So a vegan would find that unethical, so it's plant-based instead of vegan, uh, which can be a little confusing when you're first uh, starting out. Um, vegans aren't perfect in a non-vegan world. Our world right now is not fully vegan. Uh, so vegans have to make concessions, going back to that definition um, as far as possible and practicable. So that could be medications, um, cars, electronics. These things do contain animal components and there's no real way to avoid that currently. Um, Sometimes, yes, uh, there, there can be, um, there, yes, <laughs> sometimes, yes, there can, there can be some confusion with it, um, with labeling even in products. You may see a product um, that says that it's plant-based and it's really meaning the meat product 
in that item, like a pot pie, that meat product is plant-based, but there may still be eggs or something in that product. Um, and that can be confusing when you're starting out. And even now with new products coming out, I've been vegan for 15 years and I still accidentally buy <laughs> products that aren't vegan. Um, going vegan now um, isn't as challenging as it once was. Alternative options are available at almost every grocery store, even gas stations. Um, and most restaurants have more than just a salad as an option. Um, support in transitioning is easy to find and uh, is such as there are apps like Happy Cow, which can help you find vegan or vegetarian options at restaurants in your areas. There's also an app called Is It Vegan, um, where you just simply scan the barcode and it tells you what is in that product that may or may not be vegan. And it's definitely uh, helps you navigate grocery stores uh, and Happy Cow is definitely great when you're traveling to find vegan options in places. Um, you also don't really, if you're eating a vegan, a balanced vegan diet, you don't really have a concern um, for nutrition. Uh, as I, I am a self-professed junk food vegan. <laughs> I do eat all the processed things and I get all of the nutrients, vitamins and things that I need. Um, they're readily available in these products. And those in nutrients that are found in animals, they're originally getting them from the plants that they eat. So really, if you're looking to increase nutrients, cut out the millman of the animal and just eat those plants yourself. Um, I'm not quite sure. <laughs> Uh, thank you for having me speak. If anyone has yeah, questions, I think there was a question yeah. that I missed. Yeah, so we'll, um, we will probably, um, yeah, we're going to ask some questions. We're going to, we'll, we'll be a little delicate here as you know, I, I'm sure in your experience in tabling, this can, this is the kind of conversation. Well, I think it's very important. I mean, we're all about the presentation of ideas and people's perception of, you know, um, of import, I mean, these are not unimportant topics to discuss. The environment, you know, what factory farming has has done to the environment. Um, but you know, there's there's always going to be some passionate feelings on both sides. <laughs> so we'll try to we'll try to keep this. Uh, you know, we want to keep this conversation productive. Um, so I will curate here a little bit. Um, one question uh, that we have in the chat here um, is talking about. Um, Okay, so this is this is philosophical from Jay. How simple should a life forms operation be before no it no longer warrants individual moral consideration? So I think he's talking about the um, the level of animal or other biological you know biological life forms. Does veganism really address that? Like, well, yeah. Well, the way you can look at it is that when you like when you state when I stated with it. Um, Vegans don't see humans as superior, um, but equal to all living things. So those living things, we're not dropping our value. We're bringing the value of all of those other animals up to what you would consider human. So I value a pig's life, and this would be controversial to some, the same as a child, as myself. They have rights, They or they should have rights, um, and they want to live. So just like we want to live. So I, I, we really, we bring up their value rather than bring ourselves down. Okay. Okay. Um, and so, and we'll go with something maybe a little more on the, on the practical front of practice of veganism. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of, um, you know, we have a, uh, Econ, you know, income inequality and, you know, equity of, mm -hmm. of a wealth divide in our country. Yes. And some people, um, you know, live in food deserts or, or places where it's much more difficult to obtain um, a plant-based, plant-based diet, let alone, you know, vegan. Yes. What, what would you just say to, to people in that situation? Do you have any 
uh, helpful suggestions as far as if, if someone's interested in this, but but it feels cost prohibitive. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I have this conversation often because I, I, with our events, I do try to do events that are with lower income because, you know, I've been lower income. I've managed to stay vegan homeless. Um, so it is possible, but you have to figure out how. They're uh, eating vegetables, grains, and rice. Those are actually less expensive than meat products and the processed products. Like you don't have to eat uh, fake meats, faux cheeses. Those are just something that are a luxury. Yes, and they are a luxury. In food deserts, there are options. Now, there are issues with things like food pantries and things like that, not really having a lot of options. Um, so I would choose as someone who's first, who, who wants to get into a plant-based diet to try and reach out to a mentor. Like myself, I have been low income. You can find vegan products, plant-based products at the Dollar Tree, at uh, Family Dollar, all the, those things. And um, Family Dollar seems to pop up everywhere. <laughs> they, they seem to be pretty prolific. So there are ways to figure that out. Um, I And there are other um, programs that exist at like farmer's markets. If someone is uh, if someone is a um, uses food stamps, there are there are a lot of the farmers markets. You can spend food stamps in them. Our local in in the Toledo area, our farmers markets do double ups where mm -hmm. you charge ten to your card and you get twenty dollars worth of tokens to buy fruit and vegetables, and you're yep. able to do that. Um, there's always going to be access issues. Mm -hmm. um, that's why I, not all vegans believe this, I personally believe this, that there are some groups that are not going to be able to be vegan and not necessarily should have to. Um, and indigenous uh, people, for example, if they live in an area that's not really rich for plant life, um, they're going to consume animals, and that's part of their culture. So vegans aren't demanding everyone go vegan, go against what it, your culture believes. No, we're we're asking people to see the value in animals' lives, all animals, including starfish. Yes, <laughs> starfish as well. They have I, I bees have the same value. Um, so there will be people who are not able to do this diet, and I do believe that. Um, now there are vegans who honestly believe we can have a vegan world by 2026. Um, I'm not quite in that group. I'm a bit more realistic that there are some groups that we won't be able to convince and that shouldn't have to be convinced. Um, so I don't know if that answered that well, I question. That, I mean, I think that... Um... Yeah, uh, I think just, to, you know, to point out what's going on in the chat, you know, people, um, I think people sometimes are a little triggered by the description of, you know, what happens in factory farming and, um, and, and, you know, for some people that might not, that might be so stressful to them that that's not the best way to can, to convince them. So I think that was a little bit reflected in our chat, like, let's talk about how it's better for your, you know, or your, whatever the studies have been done on plant-based diets, you know, I think some people just get a little concerned that um, if we go, if we, if we describe things too graphically that people, it's hard for them to absorb. It's hard for them to absorb. Oh, yes. And, and, and honestly, that's, that's part of activism. Mm -hmm. So I, I believe there is a way to reach everyone. Sometimes that's focusing on their health. Mm -hmm. um, but I believe it's a disservice to those animals to ignore or not speak on um, what happens to them behind closed doors. Most people aren't going to a slaughterhouse. They're not seeing those things. And, and I, 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 my partner with um, Nova, she 
is not really able to watch those videos. She, mm -hmm. we use, we use some, um, like, not currently because of COVID, but we do use a VR headset that puts you inside the slaughterhouse. Oh, wow. And some people just can't handle that. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. But to not recognize these things happen um, is a disservice to those animals. But uh, like I said, I'm a little bit better at answering questions and can focus if no, someone's no. more focused on health. I no, I think that's... Um... You know, we just try to. We're we're so happy to have anyone come and present their views. But you know, we we have a very. Uh, that's the great thing about this organization is we have people that that uh, ask questions. We try to use critical thinking and the scientific method. You know, and so we we're always going to get, um, you know, people that present present their side too. So we really appreciate. If anybody else has any questions that they don't feel like I have addressed, please go ahead and put those in now. Um, and, oh, okay, so here's an interesting, uh, well, that might be too much. So we might, um, are you, are, I don't know if you're a member of our private group or not. I don't but, think so. But if you would be willing to, we would, um, we would love to have you. And if, you know, you were willing to uh, maybe address offline any other mm -hmm. questions that people have, that would be. Definitely. Great. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you for. For joining us from Ohio. That's the, that I guess is the one uh, beauty of virtual meetings is. Yeah, it was uh, my pleasure. Yes. <laughs> joined by people from all over the, the country and the world. So thank you. Thank you so much for, for being here with us this morning. Thank you for having me. Thank you. All right. So with that, let me switch back over here. Um, this point in our program is typically when we talk about the nature of Oasis, it's a 501c3 nonprofit that's entirely uh, volunteer staffed and donation funded. We try to bring every Sunday uh, informational, educational, motivational, and sometimes, um, you know, we uh, hear things that, that maybe are out of our comfort zone, and that is okay too, because uh, the world is, is full of ideas, and I think it's good for, for us to uh, get a chance to sort of Take a look at our thinking and, and question other lines of thought that, that exist in the world. So that's always, to me, a great thing uh, about Oasis. So if you have appreciated what you've seen and heard this morning, uh, you can go to our website, kcoasis.org slash donate. There's a donate link there. Um, and with that, though, we will go back to Dan. And uh, I think I had one, I think maybe I had one more question for you. Oh, what? Okay. If you're not listening to your own music, what do you listen to? Or when you're not making your own music, I should maybe not listen to your own music. When you're not making your own music, what, what do you like to I don't spend much time listening to my own music. Um, yeah. No, uh, I I mean, Ben Folds has always been a favorite of mine, mm. obviously, with the piano uh, background. Yeah. And uh, uh, JJ has introduced me to several artists over the years that I've enjoyed, uh, like... Uh, um, uh, like Frank Zappa, he mentioned, or mm -hmm. or Fish, or Umphreys McGee. Um, I I'm I have a very diverse playlist, honestly. I, anywhere from pop music to jazz to uh, classical music, jam bands. Um, I feel like having kind of the classical background and that and that evolving into several different styles has given mm -hmm. me a, an appreciation for a, a variety of styles. So that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's always good to keep an open mind. You never know. You never know what you like until you give it a try, right? True. So. I've actually been on a musical theater kick for uh, recently. While I while I run, I'm listening to uh, uh, Hades Town is a recent favorite of mine. Oh, Hades Town! I don't think I know that. I've seen a lot of stuff for In the Heights, which has been out for a while. So I that's uh, yeah. Great, I, think I, I just watched that. That was how was it? Good. Was it good? Yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah. Oh, I'm not uh you know we are not supported by Lynn manuel miranda but you know i'm a big fan of his either way all right so with that dan if you would uh play us out that would be fantastic
just saw the light inside. You recall the way the world came to an end. All our doctrine burning up and left behind. You recall the way I pompously said. still feel the scars they left on our souls the wicked judgment following our fall can you still feel the bricks on this wall Okay, let's see. I wanna everybody, hopefully everybody can give us some oasis, happy hands, love this morning for Dan. Thank you so much for joining us. It was it was our pleasure uh to get to listen to your song stylings. Thank you. Um for me. and to hear the J hear the J stories of olds, also always a good time. So with that, um you know, I got my overalls on, so I got some yard work ahead of me today. Hopefully you're doing something uh, that you enjoy equally on this lovely, sunny summer Sunday. Um, reach out to our friends from the celebrations. With that, though, take care of yourselves, take care of each other, and I will see you next week. Have a good week.